Health Quality Ontario plays a major role in supporting continuous quality improvement with healthcare delivery in the province of Ontario. Since 2008, quality improvement coaches have been providing support through structured improvement initiatives to primary care teams who are trying to improve access to primary care and improve efficiency in the delivery of their care. HQO identifies accessibility as one of the nine attributes of a high-performing health system. It's defined as people getting timely and appropriate health care services to achieve the best possible health outcomes. Sounds easy? Well, it's not always so easy. With open access, when we have to do something quickly, there is the time to do it. Let's say, for example, H1N1, um, we quickly needed to allocate some uh, spots for immunizations. And sure, we all had breaks in our schedules where we could plug in these sessions. Uh, the other thing is if a meeting comes up that we're not that was not planned. It's easier to slot that into an open access spot than to cancel four or five patients. So I find that there's less cancellations, um, more accomplishment in regards to, uh, which equals more productivity on the end of the day. It turns out that delays are actually quite common in our system. Healthcare system delays are everywhere. They've actually become the norm. Delays in getting to a primary care provider, getting tests, seeing specialists. Delays create dissatisfaction for patients, for staff who have to cope with the backlog and frustrated patients, and overbooked and pressured providers like us, who are just trying to keep up having to see more and do more. Delays cost money, too. There's system spin and time and stress and waste, and there's evidence that they can lead to worse clinical outcomes. Delays aren't anyone in particular's fault. They're not the fault of any one provider or practice. They are the result of a system that is designed to tolerate delays. We can choose to move toward a system that enables patients to see their provider when they choose by moving away from a traditional scheduling model to advanced access. Our patients at first, when we first started the open access, kept saying they won the lottery. They, they got to see their doctor that day, they won the lottery. Think about how you're doing. How long do patients wait to see you or the providers that you work with? Do you experience any of the situations here? You may benefit from implementing the principles of advanced access and efficiency. I had absolutely only a little idea before, but now I have an actual idea of real fact, real time of who I'm serving, who I'm not serving, and how best to develop the, the plan to help serve the community. It's the opportunity to do population care, population health care in a community setting, an individual practice setting within the context of a team. It's been very exciting to hear the people respond uh, to what I can see you today if I call today. They have been amazed that this is possible in this time of shortness in number of docs, number of health care providers, and yes, we still provide that. So, just what is advanced access? Advanced access in primary care is about providing patients with timely access to a routine scheduled appointment. It's usually measured in days from the moment a patient or client calls in with a request to see their provider to the day they actually see the provider. It doesn't matter what the reason for the visit is. Our work at HQO is focused on the gold standard measure, which is called the Third Next Available Appointment, or TNA. We've got a motto about advanced access. Advanced access is about timely access and continuity. See your own and don't make them wait. It's about reducing delays for an appointment. It's about patients seeing their provider on the day of their choice. It's about doing today's work today. It's matching provider supply to patient demand. And it's about improving the overall patient, provider, and team experience. It's probably worth clarifying what advanced access is not about. 
It's not about limiting your patient's ability to book in advance, like access by denial. Don't make people call back to book an appointment. It's not about prioritizing access over continuity. Don't send your overflow to another provider or walk-in clinic. It's not about making doctors or teams work harder or faster or longer. This is about working smarter. It's not, for sure not, about promoting a walk-in culture. The focus is on having the ability to book appointments same day or day of patients choosing, but not just walk in any time. And it's not about unleashing limitless demand. It's about the need to understand your current demand for appointments in order to better manage it. Normally, I end the day somewhere between an hour and an hour and a half behind schedule. Last week, first day of open access, I was half an hour behind at the end of the day, and I was thrilled. And I thought, just a fluke. And I was the same the next day, and the same the third day, and I couldn't believe it. Think about access along a continuum of different models or possibilities. In the traditional model, we tend to have a pretty saturated schedule. We're into triage and reworking things. There's multiple appointment types, well baby visits or follow-ups or initial consults, well women examinations. There tend to be long delays. This often, inadvertently, leads to deflections to emergency departments or walk-in clinics, things that actually wind up generating increased demand because folks are often referred back to see you. In essence, there's a way in which today's work tends to be pushed forward to tomorrow and beyond. People also talk about the carve-out model. This at least involves some form of a separation between urgent visits and routine visits. You have to try and predict demand for urgent and reserve space to meet that demand. Some of today's work is done today in this model, but some of it is still pushed out into the future. People sometimes also talk about access by denial, when future booking is either not allowed or restricted to a certain time period, i.e. just the next two weeks only. There's an attempt to protect open time. This doesn't allow for good backlog, i.e. that's the pre-booking for appointments that make sense, for example, appointments that need translators booked, or chronic disease appointments, or client or patient preference. In the advanced access model, you're really focused on doing today's work today, this week's work this week. It means offering clients appointments today or when they want it. It really means matching supply and demand and working efficiently. It's more client-centered, not provider-centered, so it's not about protecting the provider, but it means pulling work into today in order to protect tomorrow. The proportion of open appointments you have each day may be different and will be based on the data you've collected about the daily demand, supply, and activity for your practice. Practices often find that the proportion of open appointments they need on a Monday, for example, is very different than the proportion they need on a Thursday. Access to care can be improved. One of the keys to this is trying to understand and balance your demand and supply. Try defining demand. This is typically the number of requests for an appointment from patients or from providers as follow-up or daily or weekly or annually. Define your supply, the number of appointment slots according to the schedule, daily, weekly or annually. The key to improving access is balancing demand for appointments with supply of appointments. First, consider your annual demand and supply. You might wonder why we do the annual first, but this is the best way to get the overall reading of how in balance your practice is. It's really the, the ability to serve the number of patients in the panel given the appointments available. Calculating the annual demand and supply is relatively straightforward. First, you, you have to define the visit or revisit rates. This is the average number of times that patients in the panel visit the whole clinic or practice annually. And uh, capturing the revisit or visit rate is pretty straightforward as well. Divide the number of unique patients seen in the last 12 months 
into the number of visits to the practice that these patients generated within the same period. Each team's journey to improve access and efficiency is different as they apply the principles and concepts to their individual practice style, office settings, and patient populations. Have a look at these three case studies which reflect to how three different practices applied the principles and concepts to make access improvements. Our first case study is that of a solo MD with a panel of 2100 patients working with one RN and one receptionist in North Bay. He always had good access, but when he joined the Advanced Access Initiative, he had just returned from a three-week vacation, so backlog had built up to six days. After analyzing his demand and supply, data showed he was in a balanced position. Once his normal supply was back in place, his third next appointment dropped to two days after months two and three. Cycle time data showed minimal waiting due to the central office setup, but his average time spent with patients was 10 minutes, and this confirmed his perception. So he moved from a 15-minute schedule to a 10-minute schedule. This actually removed a very confusing section of the way they did their scheduling, where his receptionist tried to manage the patients she squeezed in between patient bookings to use the extra time he was having. Now he clearly has one schedule with 10-minute appointments and his receptionist books in units of 10, with some appointments being 20-minute visits. Every other hour has one 10-minute buffer slot for catch-up time. He quickly worked down the backlog over the Christmas holidays and began the new year with no backlog. His third next appointment has remained at zero ever since. With a panel of 800 patients, our second case study physician works in a northern family health team with allied health staff providing program support all under the same roof. She described a chronic backlog of around three weeks at the time of entering the Advanced Access and Efficiency Program. She works every Thursday in a First Nations clinic, and Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday was serving patients in her community. She was taking Fridays off. After reviewing her demand patterns, she realized that Mondays and Tuesdays were her busiest days of the week, but most of her supply those days were booked by demand that came in Thursday and Friday the week before. She decided to work Friday morning in exchange for Wednesday morning. This move significantly allowed her more availability at the beginning of the week, yet her third next appointment was still around 11. Then she tested the use of phone calls for relaying follow-up information versus booking a face-to-face -face appointment. As well, she worked with several RNs in the family health team to identify patient visits that they could help with, for example, B12 injections, blood pressure follow-up for hypertension patients, diabetes patients who were in good control, etc. This helped move her third next appointment to seven days at the six-month mark. Then she took two weeks off at Christmas, and her third next appointment climbed back up to 10 days. Weekly demand data shows that she has enough supply to meet demand, but has too much backlog. Working with experts in the advanced access community, she created a backlog reduction plan, where she's agreed over a three-week period to work all day on Wednesdays to get caught up. With a panel of 1,800 patients, our third MD works in central Ontario in a practice with seven other physicians, three nurses, and a centralized reception staff of four people. Like our second case study, she also found herself with a consistent backlog of around two weeks when she first started working towards advanced access and improved efficiency. She doesn't work Monday and as a result, her Tuesdays were always jam-packed with three days of demand waiting for her. The front office began booking follow-up appointments later in the week, Thursday and Friday mornings, leaving her Tuesday afternoons open as much as possible to accommodate Monday and Tuesday demand. Her schedule included six carved-out slots each day for urgent issues. When she began working on improving efficiency, she kept those in place until she was ready to remove her backlog. 
Then they were converted into regular slots with no restrictions for reception staff to schedule into. Her frustration was really with patient flow. She was always feeling rushed from one patient to the other with no breaks. Her lunch hour was used for catching up or dealing with squeeze-ins. When she analyzed her cycle time, she found several things. Her first appointment of the day was usually behind when she had personal obligations in the morning. This then made the entire day behind. So her first appointment was moved to 9.30 instead of 9 o'clock. Next, she observed that she was constantly getting interrupted by reception staff or nurses looking for squeeze-ins or direction for follow-up. She had a hard time saying no to patients who brought their kids in for medical attention as well. She tested a few different things to help keep her on schedule. For example, quick lunch huddles to review the schedule and discuss patient needs. Reducing interruptions to things that could be answered in 15 seconds or less between patients. She also identified repeat offenders, people who brought in multiple family members, and tried to schedule more time for their appointments. As reception staff scheduled a patient for an urgent same-day appointment, they scanned the future schedule to see if those patients had an additional appointment already booked. If they did, the physician covered both the urgent issue and the future issue at the same appointment, saving a future supply spot. For example, if John was booked for an urgent issue, and he had an appointment two weeks later to discuss his diabetes, with John's permission, these were discussed during the same appointment. By the six-month mark, she was convinced that her demand and supply were in a balanced position, and she committed to work down the backlog slowly over a three-month period, working an extra two hours per week. Again, while each team's journey to improve access and efficiency is different, these case studies illustrate that you can apply the principles and concepts to different practice styles, office settings, and patient populations to make access improvements. We found that um, one of the docs had gone on a sabbatical for about six months. She came back, and with the open access in full swing, she noticed such a difference. The patients were happier, the appointments were far more productive because the fact is that the patients came in with not a list of things, but they had one item that they had to deal with, at which point then the physician had more time to basically discuss other things as pertaining to prevention and getting them on board for that too. So it's been very, very, very positive. There's a lot in it, both for you and your patients. Teams find their patients are more satisfied with their care. They get timely access to care with their own provider. But you and your staff are also going to be more satisfied. There's less triage, rescheduling, and appointment confirmations. Things are more predictable and more manageable in terms of your schedule. Patients have shorter complaint lists. They're not waiting around and accumulating. It feels like you're keeping up. The team is better able to organize their care processes and provide continuity of care when you're doing today's work today. Ultimately, too, there's less cost to the healthcare system. Fewer no-shows, a decrease in unnecessary visits to the ER, and improved continuity also means less system spin, where people are going around and around. This was uh, quite an amazing change. Uh, I've gone from patients waiting a number of weeks, sometimes even months, to see me to being able to see them uh, almost as soon as their uh, problems uh, come up. And, uh, you know, obviously getting these things uh, seen, treated, uh, diagnosed as soon as possible makes, uh, makes a big difference. So even this morning I had, uh, you know, a mom who uh, brought in her 13-year-old daughter who hadn't been feeling well for, you know, just a, you know, a few weeks, and uh, looks like this girl, unfortunately, is going to develop diabetes, but, you know, that's someone that we were able to see right away, and we were able to get her into the system and, and seen, uh, seen quickly. I mean, almost every day I come across a, a patient that, you know, has benefited from being able to get in to see me uh, uh, so quickly. The other advantage of, uh, 
open access, as I've discovered, is my patients are much happier, and as a byproduct, I'm much happier. Uh, so this was an insight. Apparently, happy patients made, make happy doctors, and not the other way, as we used to think, maybe. Um, and certainly, my colleagues have seen me uh, a lot happier, and many of them are have been inspired by that, and they're thinking about switching to open access. Some already have, so we're studying to spread that across the group. But I'm not going to kid you either. There are some challenges and roadblocks along the way. Measuring stuff is crucial. If you can't measure it, you can't improve. Somebody on the team has to actually look at the data and do the math around demand and supply. You've got to try to engage your staff. People do better when they have been involved in the change. Try and involve everybody you can in the practice who's going to be part of this process. Change is tough for lots of people. It's good to think about developing a strategy. You could imagine that not everyone in the practice is necessarily going to see the need for change. It's important to try and come up with a plan where there's sustainability. This isn't a one-shot deal. You want to try and do something that's going to be sustainable. And often, that is where improvements fail. There's always a tendency to try and flip back to the old way of doing things. You want to try to build strategies to sustain the change. It took a lot of energy and a lot of hard work by the receptionist to, to sell it, let's say. But um, once, once it was sold in a very positive, flexible way, the patient seemed to cotton onto it very well. And we now, our whole clinic is open access. Um, once these two physicians that started the process sort of proved to everyone else that it wasn't such a bad thing, that it was very successful, it seemed like everybody else uh, jumped on board. The MacHealth Advanced Access and Efficiency Program Community is a group of improvement-minded primary care providers and advanced access experts with a common goal, who leverage and deepen their knowledge and expertise by interacting on an ongoing basis. By working together, communities support the exploration of innovative approaches and novel solutions leading to true improvements. The Mac Health Advanced Access Program community has a few main elements. There's the program home. That's the home page where you first access this course. It has the program menu where you can access the related applications and elements. We've got a blog. Look for tips and insights from experts on our program blog. The forum is where you can connect with colleagues to ask questions or discuss barriers and insights. Our resources section has outstanding resources to help you on your journey, like the Advanced Access and Efficiency Workbook. The resources referred to in each course are also available on the course landing page, where you access the individual learning modules. Don't forget to check out the calendar. The Ontario College of Family Physicians CME on the Road often includes events with topics related to advanced access or quality improvement. Sign up for our email newsletter. And we've got some key related programs. Check out quality.machealth.ca for other online programs related to the quality and family practice movement. They're based on this similar model for improvement in the plan, do, study, act cycles of change that we touched on a little bit today. And look for our chronic disease management course coming soon. We think there's many benefits from participating in the Advanced Access Mac Health community. They include some of the following. You're going to learn and apply the model for improvement and other quality improvement tools to a specific area of focus, and to be able to take this knowledge and skill, hopefully, to other areas of your practice down the road. Share tests of change and ideas, outcomes, challenges, strategies, successes, and developed resources with your peers in this initiative. You're going to start to innovate. You're going to create new approaches or revise old approaches to the way care is delivered. To improve by engaging in regular measurement of a common set of measures that will indicate whether changes are being made and whether they're resulting in improvement. You can share these changes with members of the Map Health community. Once again, the overall goal is to build capacity and capability to improve and sustain access and efficiency improvements in primary care as well as spreading improvement approaches to new areas of focus and to other providers in primary health care in Ontario.